I'm with Mark Coyle from Velo. And um, there's been a, a, a rapid development really in technology and you're here collecting some data and filming some things. So um, we understand that Velon has come to cycling. It's an initiative with 12, uh, no, 11 World Tour teams and everyone's sort of cooperating to try and enhance the broadcast of cycling really. You're the data man, so let's not talk about the GoPros at the moment. Let's talk about the data. What are, what are you learning from this experience? Well, you're absolutely right. What we're trying to do is to make cycling more accessible, to let people engage with it more, and to understand more just how hard these guys are working in races. Because what our data shows is the sheer effort and energy that they're putting into these races, be it a one-day race like Cadell Evans' Great Ocean Road Race, or stage races. They are putting a superhuman amount of effort into, into, into winning these races and to winning intermediate parts of the races, like uh, Kings of the Mountain, for example, intermediate sprints as well. And what our data shows is just how hard they're working to do that. So we're taking a number of um, sets of data off the bikes. We put our data trackers on the bikes and we pair them with the rider's power meter and also with a heart rate monitor if they're wearing a heart rate monitor. And inside our, our devices, we have a GPS chip. So all in all, we can get four main parameters from those uh, tracking devices. We get speed, we get the heart rate in beats per minute, we get power in the form of watts, and we have cadence as well, which comes with the power. And then there are some other things we can do with that, including acceleration and deceleration, and um, we can see gradients as well. And what we do is we make that available to the broadcaster which helps to enhance the coverage and therefore hopefully people become more aware and they understand more again just how hard the riders are working and we also make it available on the Velon website and through the, the Velon app. So all in all what we're really trying to do is to increase the amount of fan engagement and that then goes to one of Velon's, in fact Velon's main objective which is to change the economics of professional cycling. The Velon was set up in 2014 by then 11 World Tour teams. Um, we're now, we now have 10 World Tour teams. Um, unfortunately, Tinkoff um, are no longer. But we, you were correct when you said the figure 12 because we work with not just um, uh, and those other two teams who are Bahrain, Merida and Movistar, but increasingly we're working with pro continental teams and of course we do work with other world tour teams as well. We have a very good relationship with Bora Hansgrohe and with uh, Team Dimension Data too. And what we're trying to do is to expand Velon's um, partnerships because that's what it's all about. That's where the change will come from is by the teams working together to enable a more secure future for them um, by changing the financial basis on which the sport is, is rooted and founded at the moment. So the way that that works is we, we try to develop new technologies in the form of the data. We take it to the race organizers. We enter into a contract, into a partnership with the race. And then there are various ways in which we can attempt to monetize the, uh, the, the, the data and of course the GoPros as you've mentioned. And we're always looking for new technology to, to move into, but our big focus at the moment is in fact the, the, the data system. And we've seen, or we will see through the course of 2018, a very significant increase in the number of live uh, data racing days that we'll do, which validates our approach, which tells us that what we're developing is wanted and it's valuable, and, um, and that fans find it worthwhile. We get, we get incredibly good feedback from people. Um, in fact, just today, when um, I was turning on tracking devices on the bikes just before the race, you could see people were asking me and they were saying, well, what are these? And I said, these are the tracking devices that sends the data to the television output. Oh yeah, that's new, isn't it? We're, we've seen that. We saw that um, in Tour Down Under as well, which is uh, a race that we've just done as well. So all in all, very positive and um, getting very good feedback. It's an evolving system is, is the best way to put it. Um, you know, we take a lot of feedback from the teams and from the riders. Um, the riders all understand why the device is there. Uh, we get good feedback from them. Um, this is quite a big sporting and cultural change within the sport, whereby riders are showing their, their, their data more frequently and more openly, and, and that's to be welcomed. Um, yes, there are some challenges in there, and, and we have some firm publishing rules which we've developed in, in with the teams 
because at the end of the day, the riders and the teams have to be comfortable with what's happening. Um, but we've, uh, we've overcome some quite big barriers, both technical and cultural, and, and we're very happy with the progress that we're making. The weight of the box right now is 130 grams, and we have a mount on top of that, which is give or take about 20 to 25 grams. Our objective for the next significant upgrade in the system, which we anticipate will arrive in the spring of 18, is that we'll get below 100 grams. We're confident we'll get below 100 grams and the mount will be uh, different as well. So the thing to remember about this for anyone who knows the UCI rules is that the UCI will allow the device and the mount to be included in the minimum weight of the bike, which is 6.8 kilos. And the teams are all aware of that. They take that into account when they're setting the bikes up. So it can be used as ballast, we could say. Yes. Okay. I mean, the, the, the technology is evolving rapidly, but it was available essentially in, in uh, the data was there. It was a matter of how to capture it and broadcast it. But you're just doing, is it Bluetooth or 4G or how, does, how is the transfer of files taking place? And is that the reason why we only see sporadic use of data on the, on the broadcast? Well, yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, whatever we do, the system has to be cost effective for the race organizer or anybody who's interested in, in using it. So there are different ways that you could, uh, you could transmit data from the Peloton. Um, some of that is quite expensive. If you're thinking about sending data up to planes and down again, then there's a, a significant cost to that. Our system uses the, the mobile phone network, the 4G network, mm -hmm. or, or whatever network is available at the time. So we have SIM cards in the boxes which roam and they look for the strongest signal wherever they are. They're constantly sending back data um, and so that is one of the reasons why there are times when the data will drop away, when the broadcaster won't see the data and the data will drop down um, in our website as well. But this is a, we believe this is a trade-off that, that, um, that occurs because we're looking for the most cost-effective way to develop the system. Um, it's certainly not um, a, a, a showstopper. Um, what we do is we work very closely with the broadcaster uh, throughout the race, as my colleagues who are around the world, um, they're talking to the broadcasters in the trucks outside. We know where the, the outage points are likely to be, or, or rather we know where the signals will be stronger and weaker. And of course, sometimes there are just things that you can't really influence, which is that by the, by the nature of a sporting event, and, and there's a kind of an irony in this, at a very big event where you've got maybe four, five, six deep crowds of people, what are they doing? Of course, they're holding their mobile phones up. What does that do? That takes up some of the bandwidth, and we're, sh we're all sharing that bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So, it, I mean, I've experienced this in um, other uh, sports events that I've worked in outside cycling. Um, and it's a bit of a, a dilemma, of course, you know, to stray slightly from our conversation. Some sports, um, maybe not so much now, have been a little bit reluctant to, let's say, enable fans to capture the race or the game or the, the match, whatever, because of course those rights have been sold sometimes at very great cost to a broadcaster. And then to see the footage appearing on social media from mobile phones. So there is a big sea shift that's been going on. Um, uh, of course, it's, it's impossible to police you know, open roads where people are holding mobile phones up. But yes, to come back to the point, there are a number of factors that can influence the, the strength of the signal. And um, you know, we're constantly evolving the system to take account of that as much as possible. I think it's hugely beneficial to be coming at, at this in 2018, where there's this huge uptake, a, a groundswell of um, people coming to the smart trainer. Zwift and we've seen recently launched Vertigo. So people are, are on the bike getting the data that you're all collecting from pro riders. So in other words, it becomes a more tangible, relatable concept. If someone's pushing four or 500 watts and they're doing so for 30 minutes, they now know, oh my God, that's just amazing. So I think, you know, just the, 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 the nature of the sports fan is evolving and that's uh, along with the tech and it all complements one another very well, doesn't it? I think so, and, and you've actually just hit the nail on the head because one of the biggest challenges for us is not really even a technical challenge, it, it's, a, it's a, an accessibility challenge. It's explaining to people what's happening. So we can show them 500 watts, 600 watts, 
we saw Andre Greipel in, um, in a sprint in Tour Down Under. He hit 1,900 watts in the stage. He peaked, his one second peak was 1,900. Now, the camera can't see what you just did, but it kind of, I can say that you just went, <laughs> because that is stellar. That is absolutely stellar. And what we did was we then listed the number of appliances that could be operated by 1,900 watts of power. And that's what we have to do more of, is to explain and contextualize exactly what these numbers mean. And it is a challenge because it is quite complicated. When you start to talk about one second peak, one minute peak, normalized power, weight per kilogram, uh, sorry, uh, uh, power, um, watts, weight, per watts per kilogram, beg your pardon, I'm confusing myself there. Um, you know, it is something, it is quite complicated. And greater minds than mine spend a lot of time, performance data scientists and, and, and trainers, and they pour over these things to understand what's happening with the riders. And what our challenge is, is to take that data and to make it accessible to let people understand exactly what's going on. So we put a lot of effort into that. We're uh, increasingly producing infographics, which, which we hope will contextualize things using comparisons like how many, how many light bulbs will be lit up by 1900 watts, toasters, ovens, fridges, car engines even. And um, you know we've got a lot more of that coming through. So we have editorial producers who are experienced in cycling. They know cycling. They've, they've been writing about cycling for years. And, and, and they work with us. Um, again, as I say, we have a network of people around the world that are part of the, the Velon production team. And all of that comes together, mainly in races, um, which we're doing a lot more of. Because we're talking and we're here in Australia, one of the things that I was going to mention off the back of, you mentioned Zwift and, and these other uh, uh, virtual uh, training um, programs and, and uh, systems. Uh, we now, of course, um, have our, our own Hammer series. And again, that was one of the um, concepts that we wanted to launch to, to give the teams, in effect, their own races. Although it's Velon and it is the in-front uh, sports marketing agency who own those races and, and we, we develop them. So they operate on a franchise system. We would love to have a race in Australia. We've been looking for a, a venue in Australia. Um, we've also been talking about New Zealand more recently, but we're looking very much to expand the series around the world. We will have at least two races in 2018. We had one in 2017. And because we own the series, just jumping back to the point about the monetization side of it, you know, we talked to a number of, of a partner or potential partners um, in that area, in the, in the virtual training area, because what we can do is we can offer them that virtual riding experience with the pros from our own races, which is the Hammer Series. So we have a number of things underway there, and we hope that um, they will become increasingly successful. We were delighted with the performance and the reception that we got last year to the Hammer Series, and of course there are things we want to improve on. We know what they are. But to find that we got as much interest as we did in our live streams of the event and might I say that I do believe that live streaming is probably the future of a lot of races. It's not television coverage. Um, you can see the reaction that the Cadell Evans race has had, the Towards uh, Zero Race Melbourne. They live streamed that. The teams all got behind that because it's still quite unusual for, um, s for, for many races to have live streaming capability. But for the teams, and that's obviously my interest, to be able to push that towards fans in different time zones around the world is a great thing to have. When the team's own followers get involved, that's a significant number of people, and, and it's very, very well received. So we, we're working hard on that <coughs> to try to open up the sport and may actually make it more visible in that sense. Oh, absolutely. I mean, what it allows people to do is to provide their feedback. They're not just screaming at the television. It's basically goggle box. <laughs> with the keyboard, you know. In other words, people can immediately respond and share their enthusiasm or their criticisms or whatever the case may be. Yeah. And um, it makes the sport more engaging. And um, and I hope that that we can see pro sport evolve, uh, pro cycling evolve into into something big, you know, uh, that we understand it to be. It, it's a fabulous thing to watch. There is a lot of data. We just need to start showing some of it, and uh, um, thanks for having a quick chat about how you got it. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you.